Well, welcome to another edition of CHP Talks. CHP members and supporters, we have a very special guest with us today, someone who will be very familiar to longtime CHP members, and maybe someone who you will be in introduced you for the first time if you're a newer member or supporter of CHP. Longtime leader of CHP, Ron Gray, is with us today, and we're going to be talking about education and about the direction of our society. So this is going to be a great chat. Welcome. <laughs> Thank yes. you, Peter. It's and so great to have you, Ron with us today. Uh, Ron was the leader of the Christian Heritage Party for 13 years and is a mentor to both uh, Peter and me in, in different capacities. We've known him for a long time and really have appreciated his wisdom and his uh, passion for this country. So just as a little way of introduction, uh, Ron was born in Vancouver, BC. He was a reporter for the Vancouver Sun when the late great Jack Webster uh, was uh, its uh, editor. He, he was later regional um, uh, I'm sorry, I just lost a little note here. Uh, Regional Public Relations Officer for the CBC in Vancouver, joined the Trade Commissioner Service of the federal government and assigned to open and manage a tourism promotion office in Cleveland, Ohio. Later, he helped launch a new federal agency called Information Canada, which was the precursor of today's Service Canada. He opened and manages two first field offices in Winnipeg and Vancouver. Later, he served as Public Relations and Publications Director on the founding administration of Fraser Valley College, precursor of today's University of the Fraser Valley. He then served in a similar capacity at Trinity Western University in Langley, BC from 1983 to 1993. In the 1988 federal election, the first uh, election in which the Christian Heritage Party ran candidates, he was a candidate for the CHP in Chilliwack, BC. In 1995, he was elected national leader of the CHP, and he held that position until 2008. Since then, he's been active in the BC wing of the CHP, and he's worked with Roadkill Radio on the internet and with Culture Guard. He is an elder at Shabbat Shel Shalom, the Sabbath of Peace Messianic Fellowship in Abbotsford, BC, where he lives with his wife of 35 years, Janet, another marvelous uh, human being and a great friend of ours. Uh, currently, Ron is on the board of Compass Community Learning Centers, a new venture working to provide a Bible-based alternative to the taxpayer-supported public school system and to make it affordable to more parents. Ron, we appreciate you so much. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today, and we look forward to speaking with you about education in Canada. Thanks for the invitation. It's something that's very close to my heart. I you know, in a very real sense, I think that um, education has been the Achilles heel of our parliamentary democracy. The radical left has captured almost all the citadels of education, our universities, which train our lawyers, from which pool will come our judges in the future. You know, you remember that, um, that the lady who founded uh, real women of Canada uh, said that the definition of a judge in Canada is a lawyer with good liberal connections. <laughs> um, the, the universities also train our journalists, uh, both news and entertainment, um, our politicians, our clergy, and our teachers. And the entire school system now from universities through high schools down to kindergartens and even preschool and uh, you know very very young children are now being indoctrinated in radical radical theologies if you will because secularism is a religion and 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 of course the, the radical left also controls all the teachers' unions, which control what goes on in our classrooms. I, we feel, I feel, that it's imperative that parents recover their rightful control of their children's education. God gave the command to teachers to train up their children in, in righteousness and in God's law. 
we're losing control. We're losing God's law as a foundation for law in our society. And I, I truly believe this is fundamental, that God created, he ordained civil government to apply on a day-to-day -day basis the principles of his law, his Torah, if you will, the, the, you know, the, the legislation that, that he gave at Mount Sinai. I remember that, oh, wow, back in the late 70s, I think it was, Ted Koppel, um, an intellectual who was at that time the news anchor of ABC television news in the United States. He spoke at Duke University to one of their graduation ceremonies. And in, in an important part of his message, he said, what Moses brought down from Mount Sinai were the 10 laws, the 10 commandments. They're not the 10 suggestions. They were and are laws. And he was urging graduates from that university at that time, 40 years ago, 45 years ago, to implement the principles we learn from God's law into their education, into their life, into their service to the nation. And I think that call is as valid today as it ever was. You know, Ronald Reagan said, I think it was about 1985, he said, we are always just one generation away from barbarism. Well, obviously, he wasn't looking at the past in that. We've come about eight centuries away from barbarism. Magna Carta in 1215 was, was a declaration of a principle that undergirds every de democratic and parliamentary government in the world. And that principle was there is a higher law which even the crown must obey. Yeah, amen. And of course, uh, education, Ron, we believe begins maybe uh, even in the womb, but certainly from the youngest ages, the, the, to put the label of education as uh, some particular groups in our country would like to do and restrict it to what happens in a classroom uh, is, is ridiculous because, I mean, kids begin learning at their mother's knee, at the mother's breast, and uh, you know, the, what they see on television, uh, what they experience in the home, how they hear, you know, references to God and creation. All these things are, are building character in uh, those young lives, which are then, you know, uh, uh, manifestly uh, uh, emphasized in, in the public school education system. Uh, well, whichever education system they go through, uh, whatever kind of uh, teachers they have. But but it shapes the character, and the character of the people shapes the character of the nation. I, I would like at this point to put in a plug for a, a television service. It's free. Uh, we get it on Roku. I think it's also available on TBN and, and on, several, um, uh, on several cable systems, but it's called GSN, Genesis Science Network. And... Uh, Janet and I were just watching an excellent program yesterday in which a geneticist was talking simply about the human hand and the amazing complexity of its structure and of the nerve systems and its connection to the brain that, that enables, well, the example he used uh, was a baseball pitcher who can throw a fastball at more than 90 miles an hour. Um, there are nerve systems and muscles in the human hand and arm that do not exist in other primates that enable that to go. Yeah. It, it, there is so much available on uh, about creation and creation science 
that is forbidden in the classrooms. You know, if you were to go to one of the universities that trains our teachers and look at the curriculum of and the textbooks of their teacher training program, you would find a very strong focus on the philosophies of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And most people think he was French. He was not. He was Swiss. He was from Geneva. Rousseau wrote in the 18th century, and he wrote about education. Uh, one book, one book he wrote about education. He was the author of the concept of the noble savage, that man without, the, without civilization is pure and noble and righteous and virtuous. And we know that that's not true. People are people, even in civilized countries, even in primitive countries. They're still, they are still prone to sin, prone to selfishness and, and trying to control others. But Rousseau didn't believe that. Well, the one book that he wrote about education, the title was Emile, The Education of a Young Man. Now, it's not a textbook, it's a novel, but it, it unfolds all of his ideas about how people should be educated. And in the novel, the teacher is named Jean-Jacques, his own name. <laughs> um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau himself actually fathered three illegitimate children, all girls, whom he did not support. He put them in foundling homes, and they may have starved for all he cares. He, he, you know, but, but he did actually educate one young man. And one of the primary principles that he puts forward in his book, Emile, is that this young prepubescent boy, just around you know, uh, 10, 11, 12 years old, that his emerging sexuality is a lever that the teacher can use to steer mm. this young man's mind. You can, you can see an echo of this in what is going on in school education in what I call the government indoctrination centers that are our public school systems. Well, and if in fact, in real life, Jean-Jacques Rousseau did educate one boy. That boy grew up and his name was Maximilien Robespierre. He was the author and director of the reign of terror during the French Revolution. You see, Rousseau in his, in his book and in his other philosophical works taught that Education should not be putting information into children. It should be drawing out of them what is in their heart. Mm -hmm. Well, if you read your Bible, you know that what is in the heart of a child is rebellion. And he got exactly the results that the Bible would have predicted would come from his mode of teaching. He drew out and produced the reign of terror and what like a quarter of a million people went to the guillotine in order to control the French Revolution mm. that's and look at what's going on especially down south of the border in yeah. in the major cities of America in in Portland in Seattle in Milwaukee in, in Washington, D.C., in Atlanta, Georgia, in, in Los Angeles, what you have is rebellion in the streets. And what they're trying to do is bring down Western civilization. This is the fulfillment of what Ronald Reagan said. We are always one generation away from barbarism, the gift they are trying to give to the world is the destruction of civilization. Mm -hmm. That's Rousseau in practice. 
That's where we're headed. And that's what controls all of our, our tax-supported education system. We're paying our money to have them distort the minds of our children. Hmm. It's crazy. It's absolutely lunacy. And that's why so you're, you're involved you're with the, the Compass uh, uh, Community, what, what is it called? Compass Sorry, Community uh, Learning Center. Learning Center. Yeah. It's, it's just an attempt to return control of children's education to the parents. Look, Canada's a signatory to the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Man by the United Nations. That says that parents have the right to control the education of their children. But of course, the United Nations, like our own governments, is gradually being taken over by leftists and globalists. It's like they want to raise up the idea that there are global problems that require a global government, and the UN is saying eagerly, I'll volunteer, I'll volunteer. They're willing to be our government, and there's no less democratic institution in the world, even even the monarchies in the world are largely monarchies in name only. They, they have some degree of parliamentary control. There is not one bureaucrat in the entire United Nations that has been elected to that position. They're not accountable to anyone except a few billionaires like George Soros who are trying to control and, and craft a global government. God created 70 nations to diversify the government of the world, let various governments compete and see who can produce the best and freest society. Western civilization and free enterprise economics has done that, has liberated more people from poverty and tyranny than any other system in the world. And it, as I mentioned, Western civilization goes back to Magna Carta and principles that declare there is a higher law and that is found in the Bible. That's right. Yeah. That's what we should be turning to educate our children. That's, That's what we should be putting into their minds. Ron, it seems, you know, we often, uh, you know, the left tends to characterize Christians as narrow and uh, ones who want to interfere with other people's rights and so on. But when it comes to censorship, uh, the left has it all. They are wanting everyone else to conform. Uh, you mentioned creation, uh, if it comes to uh, certainly abortion or uh, gender issues, sexual issues, the left wants to completely control that narrative and not allow even a discussion of ideas, which we, of course, think, uh, you know, we have quite different ideas, but there is this move, and uh, it involves both uh, education and um, behavior, and we've seen it, uh, you have personal experience there at, at Trinity, or uh, you have personal experience at Trinity, and we've seen the attack there, and now there is an attack on Redeemer, uh, uh, attack coordinated by our left-wing taxpayer-funded CBC <clears throat> to force uh, people who are minding their own business and using their own money to educate uh, the, their own people, and yet the left isn't satisfied to leave us alone. They want to uh, control what is spoken and what is believed uh, in, the, in the homes and in the institutions that uh, Christians are operating and building and operating. Yeah, they, look, the left calls anyone who doesn't agree with their leftist, their Marxist doctrine, they call us Nazis. Let me, let me read to you a short paragraph of, from a book by Walter Roshning. And this is about the government of Germany under the Nazi party. By the way, the Nazi party that name is an abbreviation of the term National Socialist. They're not right-wing at all. 
They're certainly not conservative. Anyway, this is what Rauschening writes. Hitler and his malleable henchmen hated God's law. They knew that it was the only thing that stood between them and their new world order. Hitler described God as that Asiatic tyrant. True freedom, as Hitler saw it, is freedom from God's law. Rationing recounts the following sayings, the following ravings by Hitler, while spending the evening with him and other Nazi Party loyalists in the Reich Chancellery. And here's what Hitler said. The day will come when I shall hold up against these commandments the tables of a new law, and history will recognize our movement as the great battle for humanity's liberation, a liberation from the curse of Mount Sinai, from the dark stammerings of nomads who could no more trust their own sound instincts, who could understand the divine only in the form of a tyrant who orders one to do the very things one doesn't like. This is what we are fighting against, the masochistic spirit of self-torment, the curse of so-called morals idolized to protect the weak from the strong in the face of immortal law of battle, the great law of divine nature against the so-called Ten Commandments, against them we are fighting. Oh. I mean, that, doesn't, that, doesn't that encapsulate what is being done in the education of our children today? The, the decay of education started back with, uh, with Horace Mann and then with John Dewey, who were both leftists and radicals and socialists. But it really took fire in the 1960s when our governments ejected the Bible and prayer from our schools. For a long time, the Bible was the first textbook in every North American student's education for a long, long time. And that produced one of the greatest civilizations the world has seen. But the decay set in, and eventually the leftists booted the Bible out. We need, we must put it back. Because if you don't have an immutable standard of right and wrong, how will, how will the postmodernists, how can they say that we are wrong if they don't have an immutable standard of right and wrong? There is no standard by which to measure. Well, if you can't measure, you don't know. You know, the postmodernism has a, has a declaration of principle that there are no absolutes. Absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah. Remember a, a, a Reformed Church pastor who said, there are two cardinal doctrines of atheism. The first is, there is no God. The second is, and I hate him. <laughs> it's, yes. it's lunacy. Yeah. We are teaching our children lunacy. And there are, there are some good schools. I think Redeemer is one. I think Trinity Western is another. But look at the troubles that Trinity Western has had. Mm -hmm. When they wanted to introduce their, their teacher program, they had to go all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada to get the right to teach teachers to teach. Wow. When they tried to institute a school of law, the law societies of Canada, particularly the, the, of Upper Canada in Ontario, uh, they mobilized against it and said, we will not license any of your graduates to practice law. They had no record of anything that is taught in a school like Trinity Western that would incapacitate a lawyer. And in fact, we can point to a lot of lawyers who began their education there and who have 
practiced law honorably, worthily, but the law societies want to rule those guys and gals out of the courtrooms because the law societies want to control everything that happens in the court. But look what happens in the court. You recently did a, a column about, about the courts overruling the legislature in terms of the, what is so-called right to die legislation. Uh, that's an intolerable intrusion of the courts outside of their constitutional sphere of authority. For sure. You know, our, our, our Constitution says, just like the American one, that there are three branches to the government. The legislature writes the laws. The administration, which is the cabinet and the whole civil service, administers the laws. And the judiciary, the courts, judge disputes about the law according to the law as they find it written. There is nothing in that that authorizes the courts to change law, write law. And yet, you know, really, ever since the, the so-called Charter of Rights was brought in, the courts, was, the, the cabinet has tailored its laws to what it thinks the courts will approve. The courts have been elevated far beyond their proper authority. Yeah. yeah. Coming that, more evident really every year. Yeah. Yeah, that needs to be corrected. Yeah. That needs to be corrected. You know, the, the pastor couple at our congregation includes a, a lady who is, whose family are Holocaust survivors from Hungary, uh, sorry, from Czechoslovakia. And when she became a Canadian citizen, they handed her a copy of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. She took it home, read it, and came back the next day and said, where's the rest? <laughs> and they said, what do you mean the rest? And she said, well, aren't there any responsibilities? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. The yes. fault, of, uh, look, we revere the charter for a lot of things. It guarantees a lot of our freedoms and protects a lot of them, although that protection is feeble because of the, the first article that says you can brush all of this away if the courts think it, it is if the courts think it is right in a free and democratic society. But the fault of it was that it does not, well, the two faults. One is that it does not tell us our responsibilities as citizens. And the other is that it does not protect the right of private property. That's amazing. But, yeah. Peter, did you have a, a question there that you wanted to get to before we... Yeah, well, I, I wanted to... Um circle back, I guess, briefly to, to the um, issue of, of Redeemer University. Um, you know, there's this really, it seems as though it's really an unprovoked attack. I think there's a lot of questions about why, when, where that are still to be answered. Um, but the CBC sort of calling out the a, a university on an ethical standard is a bit rich considering their um, recent, um, just in the last couple of days, being exposed for letting a, a panelist be on their own program without disclosing that she had received money from the government, going against actual normal journalistic standards. And um, I, I'm not sure exactly um, how much you um, familiar with it, but I mean, as a as a as a journalist, um, when when you're commenting on an issue that you have a vested interest in, um, you have to disclose that, don't you? At the very least, listen. Going back to my time as a journalist under the late great Jack Webster, you know, 
he taught us you cannot be completely objective but you must try as hard as you can the reporter should disappear and let the reader of the news see what he has seen and form the reader should form his or her own opinion that went out with the journalism schools in the 70s which began to teach you cannot be completely objective therefore be subjective and they made the journalist the center of the story rather than the facts of the story cbc is as as far away from objective journalism as you can possibly get it is simply the state propagandist for the liberal party period end of sentence that's all yeah. Yeah. so for the cbc to start making ethical judgments on an institution of higher learning that is really trying to promulgate the standards of journalism that should prevail is as you say it's rich it's that's the irony is beyond parody <laughs> well said well said and, Ron, I, before we, uh, in terms of the cbc the the one the one guy who was there for a, a you know a, a long time who was worth listening to and, and still is worth listening to i don't think he's on the cbc anymore there was rex murphy um and he was is one of the few, and he still does, who talks about um, the um, environmentalism, basically, of today being basically a religion. And I think that circles back a little bit on what you were talking about earlier. And uh, if we, <laughs> I think we can give him a little congratulatory uh, remark in terms of being willing to say, you know, the ideologies of today, especially as he does in relation to uh, the environment, are basically religious. He's got so, the guts to say so, but the consequence of that is that the CBC censors him. They may still have him on the payroll, but you don't hear from him anymore, do you? Mm -hmm. yeah. And and that's a that's a mirror image of what is happening with big tech on on the internet. Big tech is censor, which is largely leftists and globalists. Very young people who, relatively young people, from my perspective anyway, who have become multi-billionaires and, and now control huge chunks of the information stream and they just censor whatever they don't agree with. Yeah. There is no more open public dialogue except for a few, a few nuggets in the internet like this. Yeah. Ron, uh, we're getting close to the end of our time here, but wanted to g ask you to uh, do a little a brief explanation of what you're involved with, with the um, Compass Community Learning Centers. That's a, a new uh, organization. You're playing a key role or you're involved uh, I think you're up to your elbows in it you never retired when you stepped down as leader of the Christian Heritage Party uh, you've been involved with other things uh, culture guard many uh, certain issues anyway you're you're now helping to set the uh, direction for the Compass Community Learning Centers could you tell us a little bit about that uh, our listeners may not know about it I didn't know about it until you explained it to me so uh, take a few minutes here well, it's going to look, look, we're hoping to open some learning centers in churches. The, the churches will provide the space where we will bring groups of students together and we will provide supervision in the classroom to make sure that the work gets done and, and that there's order there. Um, and also to make sure that the learning experience is Bible-centered. That's an important part of what we're doing. Um, we will link the students to online education services by certified teachers um, that are normally used by homeschoolers. But our target audience is families where because of the onerous tax burden that canadians face today both 
parents have to work and they can't be there to supervise their own children. So we will stand as surrogates for the parents by using church facilities so that we don't have the cost of brick and mortar buildings. Um, we're able to reduce the cost to about half of what the parents would have to pay in tuition at a private school. And private schools are still a good option for those who can afford them, but we want to make Bible-based um, liberal arts education available to parents who can't afford private schools. Now, we're hoping to get open by late September. If we can't do that, we'll probably be, well, we will then certainly be opening in January of 2021. So right now, um, things are still in a formative state of flux. We've, we've got a board of people uh, all working as volunteers, and we're gathering together the learning facilitators. We call them ELFs. Um, and we're getting the, the buildings volunteered. There's three churches now in the Lower Mainland and more coming, I think. Uh, so what we're hoping to do is get going in the lower mainland of British Columbia this year, next year to expand to all of BC, and later to expand across Canada. So uh, look, at a later date, I'll come back onto CHP Talks and give you uh, some websites that you can go to, or if you wanted to monitor um, cultureguard.com, I know that we will be making announcements there of where parents can get in touch in order to become involved. We're not quite ready for that yet, but God willing, it, it will come together soon. Very good. Well, thank you for your work for the next generation as uh, this whole conversation has really been about it's the direction of our society and the next generation um, has such a key role to play in that. Um, why don't we just have a couple final thoughts and then we'll wrap this up. Um, Rod, did you want to uh, lead out well, on that? I, I want to also thank you, Ron, for your work, not only uh, uh, in the current current activities you're involved with, but also for the CHP. Uh, well, if I, can, if I can interrupt, I want to thank you guys for what you are doing through CHP. Although there's a, lo a lamentable number of churches and pastors who don't think so, civil governance is a legitimate area for Christians to have a voice. Uh, God ordained civil government to reward the righteous and curtail those who do evil. That's what you guys are working to do. And it's my prayer that more and more churches will see that you in CHP are pioneering the way where the churches should be going. You know, it was, it was the churches who had the biggest influence of all in the American Revolution, what they called the Black Robed Regiment, pastors who would, in those days they wore black robes, and they would stand in the pulpit and take off their robes and reveal underneath a, a, a uniform in George Washington's army, and they would mobilize their con congregation to throw off the chains of tyranny. I, we have the same job to do, and you guys are now the leaders of our Black Robed Regiment, and I salute you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Yeah, we, uh, the topic of education goes on. Uh, we have adult education uh, that we're looking at trying to educate the body of Christ across this country and our responsibilities. and. And uh, we thank you for your uh, leaders, leadership, uh, your pioneering for the Christian Heritage Party in that regard. Um, I only had to step down because I was getting too old to do the travel that you do so well. Well, 
Anyway, it's been a great pleasure uh, speaking with you again, Ron, and we look forward to the next opportunity. So uh, God bless you. And uh, Peter, you any final words there? Well, I just want to encourage everyone who's listening and watching, if this is maybe the first CHP talks that you've listened to, um, keep keep listening. We're trying to do them every week, and we've been doing them every week for quite a while. And uh, so if you want to be educated on various topics of politics and uh, the, the direction of our country, listen to some back episodes. We've had some great guests on, um, including today. So thanks again, Ron. Thanks again, Rod. And uh, we hope to uh, see you all again next week. God bless. Yeah.